morning, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. I know that there's like allergies all over the place kind of going around. I see people getting a little bit congested in things. And either the weather gave it to you or I did because I've had it for about a week. Um, but anyway, it's good to see you. Welcome to our services. Those who are watching live stream, thank you and welcome to you as well. Uh, you've been watching the screens um, and see the announcements and things that are there. Two, two announcements uh, I wanted to highlight. One is not in the bulletin, but it's up here. And I announced it last uh, Wednesday night. And uh, I met with the deacons on Tuesday night. And we agreed to, we wanted to bring Brother Ralph uh, Wright, who is uh, already an ordained deacon from... Uh, uh, the Golden Avenue Church that uh, has been here with us, he and Helen, for some time. Um, on to with the deacons as an active deacon. They're members here, of course. And uh, so in order to do that, we needed to meet and have a special call meeting for that purpose. And I have to announce it twice. So Wednesday night was once. This morning is twice. And third time sold, like an auction. On Wednesday night, we'll have a brief uh, uh, special call meeting for that purpose to uh, approve and uh, you as the church body on Wednesday evening right before our uh, uh, fireside chat at 6.30. Um, Saturday, 9 a.m., this coming Saturday, if you can, come and help us out. We need to have a little work day out in uh, the, around the church, let's say from 9 a.m. to noon, if you can come. And uh, a lot of weeds and things growing in our flower beds, getting it ready for our spring now, and some of the things that we'll be doing, putting out flowers and shrubs or whatever, different things, sprucing up, once again, the outside of our church. So if you can come, picking up trash sticks out in the yard, help uh, Brian, different ones that'll be doing mowing. So, uh, Bring uh, whatever utensils you'd like to bring or things, and uh, we'll have a good time and fellowship together Saturday morning, weather permitting. Uh, if it rains, I won't be here. Um, but um, so we'll, we'll schedule another date when that time comes. Um, today is somebody's special birthday. Uh, and it's like... Initials R, second letter is O, what's that third letter? What's the third letter? C-K-Y, Rocky 14 today, congratulations, happy birthday Rocky, and uh, so we're, we congratulate you son, congratulations to you, uh, growing up on us, one of our little fellows around here at church. Uh, let me mention to you a few prayer concerns. Kaylee and Gage, of course, lost their baby. Continue to pray for them. Um, Helen Wright's uh, brother, uh, Raleigh Christian, is on hospice. And lift him up to the Lord in prayer. Down in Alabama, I think, isn't it, I believe, Ralph? Um, Joe uh, Hayes is in rehab. Lift her up to the Lord in prayer. Barbara Wright's grandson... It's on the back. There's a list here. But uh, in the military, he's uh, now in Kuwait. And she asked us to remember him in prayer because Kuwait is right next to Syria. And you know what's going on now with uh, over Syria. We had to retaliate with uh, Iran that uh, killed a contractor and wounded several others at a spot uh, over there. And now with a drone, and we've attacked over there and killed some of their people. So they said they're going to retaliate. Uh, Jeremy is over there in that area, and uh, Barbara, we covet your prayers as we want to pray for all the folks over there and the safety and wisdom of what's going on. And for unspoken requests, as well as those that are mentioned on the back of the bulletin. And Brother Charlie mentioned to a little boy that he's been taking the ball games and stuff around here. Got a lot of complications. Zandy's... Uh, Zanda uh, is up at St. Louis, really a lot of complicated stuff with this little feller. And so God knows who he is, he knows the needs, and we'll just place it before him today, okay? Pray with me. Father, I want to thank you for all who are here today. 
I pray for those that weren't able to come, for those who are watching. Uh, speak to our hearts through your word, through song. And Lord, be with those that's been mentioned in prayer concerns today. Bring comfort to those that's lost loved ones. And we pray, Father, uh, that you'll just lead and guide us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Miss... beautiful rendition of at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light I thought I hope everybody in this building has been at the cross and saw the light of Jesus what would we do without him now anybody that wants to come up and sing if you're visiting with us or even if you've been here a while we'd love to have you up singing with us if you love to sing just come on up oh I think we're missing somebody back there or no you coming up, Matt? Or... <laughs> oh, I had to twist his arm really hard. Yeah, we need little Matthew up here. All right. Everybody stand with us as we worship. <clears throat> as we worship. I love this song. I've been singing this song since I was a kid, and I, I suspect that many of you will too. And it's a song about Jesus calling us all to come and dine at his table. So let's just feast on Jesus' table the whole service and just uh, be sensitive to his Holy Spirit and listen as he speaks to your heart. Just say. 
Now, this is a real old song. It goes back, you did. You all did this in your church, didn't you, back with your yeah. dad and family? You know, I don't have the, the year on this, but it's pretty old. Bill and Gloria Gaither used to sing this, if you all have heard them. May I see what you want? Okay. <clears throat> Some people who say we cannot tell whether we are safe or whether all is well. They say we only can hope and trust that it is so. Yes, I ought to know. Yes, I know when Jesus saved me. Cleansed and made the very me moment He forgave me. He took away my heavy burden. He gave me peace with me. Satan can't make me doubt it. It's written, I'm gonna shout it. That's why I'm gonna shout it. For I was there when it happened. Oh, my. Yes, I ought to know. Now it don't can tells me salvation is not real. For the world may argue that we cannot feel the heavy burden lifted and the passion go. Oh, my Lord, I guess I ought to know what He saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole. Yes, He took my sin, with peace within, can't make me doubt it. That's why I'm going to shout it. Oh, my Lord. Yes, I ought to know. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. Uh, well, let's, let's go home. Okay. I tell you. Well, that's, isn't it, is that, that's true, isn't it? I guess I ought to know. I was there when it happened. Thank you, honey. I like that old song. I like to see our get our choir up here getting on them parts and stuff and 
three-part harmonies and stuff going on, some of them oldie goldies there. I think our folks would like that, Deborah, uh, to do that. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them to Luke chapter 14 this morning. The Gospel of Luke chapter 14, we'll be reading verse 15 through verse 24. The title of the message today is Serving God on Our Own Terms. Serving God on Our Own Terms. Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And I'm just going to stop right there for a moment. Brother Greg, he's rolling the things for me and hold that thought there, verse 15, for a moment. If you read in the early part of chapter 15, verse 1 and following, There's some things taking place. Jesus has been invited to one of the Pharisees' homes, apparently a prominent person. The name is not given. And everybody else comes, and this prominent Pharisee, a Pharisee, remember, is is the legal mind of the Jews, religious, legal. They they did believe in in resurrection. The Sadducees did not. But they argue, and of course, they had their religious minds to be like, let's say, Democrat and Republicans arguing. Or you could put it, Baptists and Catholics arguing. And they all had their opinions and things. But Jesus was invited to go to a prominent Pharisee's home in the town. And he invited, in turn, he, the Pharisee, invited a lot of other people that came and when they gathered into the house, it's interesting when you'll read, when you go back and read this, but I want to give you the setting, the background for the message, for what was coming. And so everybody filled into the house. And the Bible says earlier, uh, before our text here today, that Jesus took note of where people were sitting. That people just came up, and this is where the scriptures came into where Jesus said, if somebody invites you in, don't try to take the most prominent seat. Of course, if you're a Baptist, you don't have to worry about that. Well, I guess in the Baptist church, the prominent seat's the back row. <laughs> I'm sorry, John, Gary, y'all got them covered over on them sides back there. But, but really, you no, know, today they aren't filled. You know, that, that's the thing. Usually those are, tr- truthfully, you agree, right? I'm just, I'm funny, but you agree that in most church, you'll start, we start filling up from the back to the front. But that was the thing. So Jesus, he makes note, and he sees that here they are, and he looks at them as he's sitting down, and they begin to serve, and he says to the Pharisee, to the, as he's looking at, that when you, you know, about concerning inviting guests and things to come into your home, uh, that you need to also, but he knows there's all prominent people, people of importance, in his estimation, of course. And if you invite, that you'll have all your, that's who you would invite, right? You'll go out and invite these people. So, and Jesus said, you are to invite the main, the whatever people that would come. You have this great feast and things to come. And in the process, when he's coming, as he's, he's telling this Pharisee this, there's another one who's listening. And he's listening to what Jesus said. And, and there was a man there that had dropsy, a disease. And it was the Sabbath day. And Jesus looked at the Pharisees and some of them and asked them as they was there, he said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they kind of looked at each other. Jesus said, what man among you saying to these there? He said, which one of you would not, if your best donkey I'll use or your ox or your ox or donkey falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, you wouldn't put your hand out to get him out. They still wouldn't answer. A lot of times we just answer when it suits us, you know, what is coming in. But what, there's in a point here that was what's coming. You know, there must be something that he's, so here he is. They're always trying to trick him. He's putting it out here to say, hey, here it is. I want you to know God 
will bring you to the point whether you answer it in your heart or you answer it with your lips. You know what the truth is. And he said, which one of you wouldn't reach out to do that? And then they didn't answer. And so Jesus then says to the man with the dropsy, you're healed. And the man goes out and like they're just, they're sitting there stunned because this has taken place in their presence of here is a prominent Pharisee's home and they're all prominent in their church of, you know, the Sanhedrin and all the different things. And this is not supposed to take place. But what can you say? And this one guy, so, so this one guy comes up and he's asking a question because here in this banquet, he's concerned about what Jesus is saying. And so there, let's read it again. And when one of them that sat at meat with him, sat with Jesus, that was having a meal, heard these things, the things that I just told you about. When he heard these things, then he, the man, says, to Jesus, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, they were celebrating a feast, a time, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But then he said unto him, this is Jesus now saying unto that man, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I've bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. That would be ten oxen, in case y'all knew what a yoke was. And I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And I like this one really good. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. I know a lot of guys like that. Girls go to church, he don't, but I believe I can change him. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know what? I believe I can You know what happens? She stops going to church too. And then in verse 21, So that servant came and showed his Lord these things, and then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the main and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done. So apparently there was a time span in between in this verse following. And he said, Lord, it's done in verse 21, thou, as thou hast commanded, and yet there is still room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. And then Jesus says, For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. This was the Lord's word. The Jews had a series of ever-recurring conventional pictures of what would happen should God break into history. If this really happened and they was looking at it, they had all kinds of different banquets and ideas that was established. And one of the pictures of what they had arrived to was the picture of this messianic banquet. This was what they were gathering together for and celebrating and discovering here, this banquet they was coming in and, and talking about. This was what was on their minds. And, and Jesus knew this mythical story of what they were thinking that would take place, how they had uh, concoctured it up into their minds about how it would be. And so from that basis on that day, they were saying that God at this messianic banquet would give a great feast, according to them now, to his people, at which time uh, Levithan, the, the great sea monster, would be a part of the food. <laughs> they were saying that, so here it would be like saying the devil, you know, or whatever. But anyway, they had this mythical about this great sea monster that was there or whatever, and that that would at this banquet, because he was captured, he was done, he was killed, and he would be served up at this banquet and be part of the food. And this was the banquet that the man who spoke to Jesus was thinking about 
when he spoke of the happiness of those who would be guests at the banquet, he was thinking only of the Jews. Of course, that was it, of my people, that we're, we're going to be there. We're going to be the ones that's going to eat at the banquet. I've heard many people talk about uh, the marriage supper. You know, who's going to be, who's going to actually be the marriage supper? Who is the bride and who's going to be at the marriage supper and who's going to be the guest? You know, of all the different things, talking about the end time of when Jesus comes. The Orthodox Jews did not believe that Gentiles nor sinners would have a place at the feast of God. And Jesus knew that. And that's why Jesus spoke this parable. In Palestine, when a man made a feast, the day of it was announced long beforehand, and the invitations would be sent out, and and they would be accepted. But the hour was not announced. The day was announced. We're going to have a feast next Wednesday. I'll let you, will you come? Oh, yeah, we'll be there. We'll be there. And then the the Lord of the of the house throwing the feast or whatever, the one there, and then he would say, I'll let you know the hour, what time the feast will be. But I need your commitment. Will you be at that invitation? I give you an invitation to be at this feast, this tabernacle, this time, but the hour you don't know. Sounds familiar, don't it? The Lord is coming. You've been given an invitation to come, to open your heart, to give it to him. But the hour and the day, you don't know exactly when, but you know it's going to be soon. But you see, this is what they were picturing in their minds as that was taking place. And so what happened is, is the day came and all the things were ready, and the servants were sent out to summon the already invited guest. It's like they, it wasn't like they didn't know that it was coming to set it aside for that particular day. You know what's happening on Sunday? It's the Lord's day, hallelujah. We're going to meet in the Lord's house. You know what's going to happen on so-and-so. We look forward to dates. We put them, we, we, you know, this is the idea, the mindset to look at and see where we are in our relationship with God. So they went out and summoned all the invited guests to accept the invitation that beforehand was given out, but then you look at it to say, and then to refuse it when the day came was a grave and serious insult. When they had already said, we'll be there. Food's already prepared. Preparations have been made. For so many to come, I want to say to you, the Lord loves to see his house filled. It's an indication of the love of the people of God to gather together and to worship and to let those who are unbelievers see that we love God, that we want to worship God, that we cherish God. We're thankful for God. We're glad to be a part of the banquet of the feast. That's a celebration, a time of happiness. But to accept that invitation and then refuse it when the day comes is a pretty grave mistake, a serious mistake, because it really tells your heart really wasn't in it. Oh, it sounds familiar to me, does it? Not to you. I'm giving my life to Jesus. A revival comes, or sometimes in church or whatever happens, and to see people get on fire for God, and then all it was, but then we start drifting away and out. You know, people say, well, nobody called me to invite me to church. If you're a member, if you're saved, you don't have to be invited to your church. Hello. And when you come to the place, and, and the same is true as a child of God. That you're already, we are born again believers in Christ. We are already invited guests. Well, in this parable, the master stands for God. The original invited guest stands for the Jews. And throughout all history, they had looked forward to the day when God would break through, that he would break in, and when he did, They tragically rejected his invitation. 
Because, you know, he didn't come like they thought he would come. He didn't do what they thought he would do. He wasn't what he, they thought he would be. We might say he didn't look like they thought he would look like. I think there are so many people that get so confused about building up the imagery of what they expect God to do or to be or something in our own lives is that we get to that point to where we want to serve God on our own terms, not on his. The poor people from the streets and the lanes stand for the tax gatherers and the sinners who welcomed Jesus when he marched into Jerusalem as they come in on the donkey and, and there during the time of Easter to come before that Jesus would be crucified and, and things as they come in to celebrate all the different things to recognize him when they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, and the palm leaves as they wave and all the different things that was taking place. Here was a great celebration. Because they received, they were then therefore invited, these publicans and sinners, people. That's what made the other people mad because, you know, they wanted to isolate those people away because it was us that's prompt and pious as we come in and look at me. You know, and I know sometimes people, like if you don't wear a tie, you know, you you can't preach. You know, there's some place, if you don't have a white shirt on, you can't preach. We we got all kinds of legalisms and laws and things. I want to tell you, it's not whether you wear a suit, it's not whether you look like this or that, but it's the Word of God. The power of the gospel, the word of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified, as Paul was saying, I'm not ashamed of him in Romans 1.16. But those that were excommunicated from the thoughts of those who were religious-minded, thinking they would be in was, and when the master sent out, were in the lanes were tax gatherers, sinners were welcomed by Jesus. And those who gathered in from the roads and the hedges, when he said, go into the highways and hedges, that was for the Gentiles. That was for those that that were the farthest away. They were the lowest of lowest of of all that was there when it came back to the place to where the service was saying, we have invited the halt and the maim and all the other different ones, and they've come in, but here they are. And you look and see. And he said, go out in highways and hedges and compel them. That was the Gentiles. That was those who were the farthest removed sinners of anybody they ever expected. They had a way into heaven. Was those kind of people. One term in our text has been sadly misused in verse 21 and 23. It's the two words, go out. Augustine, long ago, used this term, to justify his religious persecution. He was used as a defense and even a command to coerce people into the Christian faith. You know, I think it was used as as a defense in the sense of the Inquisition, the thumbscrews, if you heard the racks that they were put on, the threat of death and imprisonment of all the different things. They, if you didn't, you know, become sometimes there were some people, people go to extremes. At one point, you're killed for being a Christian. It just depends on who's in control. And the next point, somebody comes in like Augustine or Constantine, and they want to try to make you a Christian. We're going to baptize the whole Roman army, you know whether you like it or not. And now you're a Christian now that you're baptized. That that water, just saying that, makes you no more a Christian than if you stood in your garage all day you could become a car. There's no way. It wouldn't happen. But there are people, and that's how Christianity got corrupted. That's how the water got muddied because we had all these ideas and thoughts and things that would come in of what people could do. Well... There ought to be only one compulsion that constrains us to go out. And that is the love of Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, The love of Christ constraineth us. So, for whatever reason that we go out, the words expressed in the Bible, Jesus says, Come, and he says, Go. 
And there's a time to come to the Lord. There's a time to go for the Lord. The compulsion of Christ within our life. I want you to notice three things here in our text. The first man said in verse 18, I bought a field. I'm going to see it. Now, I know that could happen. I, I mean, I... If I had a good word, somebody told me, I know where 50 acres is for sale, and the guy's wanting whatever, if it was flat rock or tall rock or whatever, if it's 50 acres and the price was right, it probably would get my attention, sight unseen. And then I might go out there, and it's a mountain, and you can't, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you could be taken. But when you look at this guy, it says he allowed the claims of business to assert the claims of God in his life. I bought a field, and I'm going to see it. He already knew the day that was set and already accepted, as Jesus was saying, accepted the invitation. You talk to somebody who says, I don't know of anybody, very few people, that says, no, I don't want to be a Christian. I know plenty of people says I'm not a Christian. I know a lot of people that says even more people that say I'm a Christian, but I'm not the kind of Christian I ought to be. I don't really know any. I don't have any on my list that says I'm I'm the very best Christian that you can find. That list is blank, so after church you can tell me, give me and say, put my name down there. I'd be like the guy that said he looked at the paper and saw all those names that he had wrote down there. He said, what's all them names? And he said, this is the people I can whip. He said, you got my name on there. And he said, yeah. He said, well, you can't whip me. He said, oh, I'll mark it off then. So I think I'd be like that. I'd say, oh, well, you know, if that's, that's the case, so to write down but the list of what goes on with people when we look at this man in all that he was doing to assert the claims of God, he had been prepared, been asked, been invited, accepted the invitation. But he made other plans. I think that in this verse we can see that it's, that it's really possible to become so immersed into the world that we have no time for worship, we have no time for prayer, we have no time for God. Because we get so involved into our lives in the world. And by the way, you're going to spend less time here in this world than you are going to spend in eternity, whether it's in heaven or it's in hell. So there, you have less time here. So don't become so, my friend, so immersed into that you forget your obligations, your duties. Romans chapter 1 says there is no excuse for those that don't worship God. They look at creation. There is no excuse for you to be able to say that, that I can't do that. I can't do this or whatever it is that when you come into your life. Because I think what it is is saying that you won't. You see, rather than making the intentions of saying what we're going to do for God, it's just the fact that it comes that many times our mind's already made up. So many people will tell you what you want to hear. I'll be there, preacher. I've learned to say for myself, Lord willing, because I'm I'm just that little bit more smarter than what I guess they are because I saw it in the Bible and it said, don't say I'm going to go to town and buy or sell because tomorrow may not come. You don't get to do it. It says, you say, Lord willing, I'm going to do it. So I say, whether I'm lying or telling the truth, of course, if I'm lying, I got 30 seconds on my rule to tell you that I'm kidding. But on the other part is that I've learned to say, Lord willing, I'm going to do that. They say, so if you say, Lord, preacher, Lord willing, I'll be church Sunday. I can take that. But now if you know you're going to do something else anyway, if you say, I'm not keeping a roll book, God's the one that keeps the roll. I'm not taking care of all that. But he sends out the invitation. So who are you, where are you, when it comes that you've already received the invitation? 
What, what has, as you're looking over, that, that hour, we know the daytime is coming, that when man must work, where night is coming, where man can work no more, and so we know the end time is coming. So are you ready? Because the hour comes. Jesus says we're at that 11th hour. It's right at the end. The second man in verse 19 said that he'd bought five yoke of ox, that he was going to try them out. It, um, so as I've told you, that's ten oxen. And he wanted to see how they worked together, see what he bought. When he, uh, I think that what we see here is we let the claims of novelty upsert the claims of Christ in our life when we become Christians. Uh, this happens when, oftentimes when people get new possessions they become so taken up with them cars houses boats clothes fashions of whatever thing that whatever whatever it may be that's something that pulls you the novelties of life that you get into that you got to try them out to do all the different things that is what this man got caught up in and you notice both of them asked permission please have us excused let me, let me ask you a question. Do you think they got excused? According to what I read in the Bible, they weren't excused, were they? That when they, when they asked, would you please have, in fact, what we notice, somebody else got their seat, didn't they? You know, you don't want to lose your place that God wants for you within your life to come, that he is, he's, because no man, the Bible says, no man can come unto God except God call him. So you have to have that invitation. You can't just barge in or whatever and think, and, and, and there used to be times when I thought in my lost mind, soul, and heart that I can just, I can, I'll serve God on my own time, and I'll come when I get ready. I'm just not ready. I don't think I can live it. I can't do this or that. And I forget all about the working of the Holy Spirit and the calling of God and the finished work of Christ and knowing that, that the time has already been set. The banquet is about to happen, and I've been invited to say and to make a commitment, will you follow Christ? Will you come and celebrate? Everything's paid for. Everything's done. All it is is your time and your commitment to come to say that you'll come, go to church. You know, that's the thing. Go and worship God, celebrate God. You're, you're glad to be there. You're an invited guest. The third man, I, and, and, and I'll finish this, God gets crowded out in our lives, don't he? The third and final, verse 20. <laughs> that fellow said, I have married a wife. I know all about that. <laughs> but what I, what I don't know is when he said, I cannot come because of that. And I'm going to tell you, Listen, listen to this. The reason he said this, this is he did not ask to be excused. This man did not ask to be excused. He actually had an excuse. And you say, what? One of the wonderful, merciful laws of God in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5. I don't know if I gave it to you, Greg, or not, uh, on the screens. Deuteronomy 24, 5. Listen to it. When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife. Hallelujah. He shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken. As they say, a happy wife is a happy life. <laughs> That's saying, he, say, he said, I've taken a wife, 
when you come to understand, he didn't ask to be excused or whatever, but he was already excused that God was saying to give them the opportunity to say that when they go, it's getting to know each other. This is the problem so much happening in our world today is that when people do or happened years ago, over the years when you got married, you got into all this different things within your life, or maybe like myself, we got pregnant, so we got married when we were young. And you think that'll make it. And then what happens, you get married so you get to know each other. But when you, and then you have kids and, and all the things, and then you drift apart because you don't know. And so you look at that, that's a pretty daggone good law, isn't it? As to say that you'll spend a year together. What a honeymoon. Didn't say where, so you get to pick and choose on that one. But you'll come home to look at, but this was the third one, but yet nevertheless he didn't come, and it was understandable as to what was happening, that no doubt this law this man had in mind is one of the tragedies of life, I think sometimes, when good things, the best of things, can crowd the claims of God out in our life. And there there is no lovelier thing than a home, but yet a home was never meant to be used selfishly. So they live best together, God and home. And when God and home is right, I can promise you church is going to be right. Because when you got a, a, when Christians have a happy life at home and things are going there, things aren't going to be in such a turmoil when we come together. If we've got a happy life out where we are because we're happy with God, we're following God, we're trusting God, we're committed to the invitation of God within our life, that everything else will fall into place within our life. In verse 24, Jesus said, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So, though the guy didn't ask for the excuse, but they weren't going to get to be a part of the banquet. All three. None of them. If so, you would assume that the guy that was to get married knew the date of when the bank was going to come, or maybe he, had, he wouldn't have accepted the invitation to say, yeah, I'll be there, if it was after he had already committed to being married. But he accepted the invitation, and then, you know what happens sometimes? The way things really work the best is, is that your husband, your wife, isn't number one in your life. If they are, they're in the wrong position and they will be dethroned. Your children is not number one in your life. If they are, they'll be dethroned. Your job is not number one in your life. If it is, it will be dethroned as well. Because there is only one spot, one person that can be number one in your life if you are to be right with God, and that is, of course, Jesus Christ. A name above all names. No other name given on earth or in heaven whereby men may be saved than the name Jesus. So when home and and God and things are together to say that when you put Jesus, you put God on the throne of your life, That's why I use Matthew 6.33 so often. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. All the different things of putting God where he needs to be in your heart. So I want to ask you today. Have you accepted God's invitation? If you have not, will you accept God's invitation? And what are you talking about, Brother Odell? Well, I think, obviously, first thing is that for you to be saved. If, if, if you're here today, it's obvious that you wouldn't be here had God not done a work or something in your heart to know or to hear the Word of God, that hearing God speak into your heart, that you need Him. He's talking to you right now. Maybe He says things before. Remember, there's no excuses. He just wants you to come 
business, possessions, natural affections, if, if aren't careful, can disrupt our service for God. Because we got too much other stuff going on, there will always be something that will keep you from doing what God wants you to do in your life. But what you have to decide is to whether you're committed to the task of what you say. Jesus said, let your yea be yea and let your nay be nay. In Acts chapter 24, verse 7, 25, Felix said to the Apostle Paul, Go away, and at a more convenient time I will call for you. Apostle Paul tried to tell Felix about all that God could do and how God saved him, his testimony. How important God was and only know God through Jesus Christ and give him. And he said, would you become a believer too? Would you follow him? Because he could tell, oh, Felix's heart was touched. Felix was breaking out in sweat. I'm telling you, he was, and he looked at, and here he was as a leader. And, and he just, he said, almost thou persuadest me. Come at a more convenient time. Well, that's on your time and not on God's time. So what is God saying? Will you accept? What is he saying to you? Because you really want to say, Lord, I want to serve you on your time. I want to be on your time. Listen to what he says. Obey what he says in your heart and follow him. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for your word today and for blessing us with your presence. And I pray, Father, as you have spoken and touched many hearts today, that you will help us in our decisions, whether it's recommitment of our life or whether it's giving our heart to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Help us in making that decision to follow you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing in our invitation this morning. I'd like to meet you right here at the front. God's leading you, whether it's to join the fellowship of this church, give your heart to Christ, pray around this altar. You may need to make some kind of decision right there privately. I don't know. That's you and God. But do answer the invitation that he's given you as we sing. That's right. Step out from where you are right now. Back of the church, the front, the middle. Come on, I'll meet you right here. Oh, Jesus. Without Him, how lost. Let's do that another verse, honey. Last verse, unless someone comes. I'd be enslaved. Without him, I would be hopeless. With Jesus, praise the Lord. Come on. Would you like to give your heart to Jesus this morning? You need to rededicate your life. Follow him as he's guiding you. Do you know him today? You can't turn him away. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Without him, how lost. I would be. And all God's people said.
Amen. It's so good to see you. Love each one of you. Thank you for being here today and uh, keep those that we've mentioned in prayer. Remember Wednesday night, we have a a fireside chat and special call business meeting. Be here with that. We have a great time, had a great meeting last Wednesday, and we look forward to that again this Wednesday. All right, honey. Leave us. Thank you all. Have a blessed week, and we'll see you Wednesday night, Lord willing.